Hey everyone, it's Steve Cronin. Welcome to the second video of the Integral series. This one is my favorite. This one is on human development or stages of psychological development throughout one's lifespan. Now, it's generally agreed upon by like psychologists or philosophers that human beings haven't always been like the smart, capable, good looking folks we are now, like walking around the earth, like having a good time, right? Or in some cases, like there are actually is a lot of negativity that goes around in the world, right? But we started off from a place that was much, much more dark and much, much worse than where we are now. And that's where this idea of human development or developmental psychology comes in. So generally, if you think about human development, you can think about it in two ways. Firstly is the developmental stages that an individual goes through in their lifetime. For example, the mind of a child and how they perceive things and how they think the world works is going to be different than the mind of an adult, right? And Piaget touched on this in his developmental model, right? You, have these, you begin as a baby with the sensory motor stage. All you can perceive are like lights and colors. You can't really assign meaning to them. You're not really sure what's going on. You're just like this sensory organism going around, like taking in all this information. And after a while, after you mature uh, psychologically and physically, physiologically, right, then your, your perception is able to come in. You're, you're able to start attaching meaning to different things and, and sensation turns into perception. And so you get these like formal operational stages, concrete operational, these stages come later in PJ's model. As you grow up, people see the world differently. The second way to look at this is that human beings have been evolving as a race for a very long time, right? So in the same way a child is born and then develops to an adult and then eventually passes, you can look at the human race and see a group of people from hundreds and hundreds or thousands and thousands of years ago, right? And how they were all the way up to now. And you do that by just kind of like looking at trends and when different uh, areas of consciousness have sprouted in uh, the world, in different communities, and then kind of propagated themselves outwards towards individuals that have grasped onto them and made them a part of their own identity so that sooner or later, every individual that grows up on the planet uh, follows in these stages through their lifetime, but also participates in the ever-evolving uh, evolution, right, of the human race. So I'm going to give an example of what I mean by that because I feel like that's probably not very clear as I just explained it. So science, rational thought, right? Let's focus on that, rational thought. A child, a small child, is not capable of rational thought. A small child generally thinks of things in a very kind of like magical way. Uh, sometimes like they think their thoughts can directly control reality, right? Which isn't necessarily the case, or at least I don't think that's the case, okay? So, but when did rationality enter into this, the lifespan of a human being, right? Well, may, maybe, you know, as a younger child, maybe when you, you're in like first grade or something, you get a sense of like rationality, sometimes or oftentimes even before then. Okay, so if you think about the human race, when did like rationality enter into the human race, right? So historically, it, it seems pretty clear that one of the main like instances of rationality exposing itself into mass consciousness was in the Enlightenment period, right? And that's where science was kind of getting started, okay? Uh, philosophy though as well, uh, philosoph philosophers back in the day, right? Maybe, so Isaac Newton, for example, we'll call him a scientist and a philosopher, right? Science wasn't perfect back then, like we didn't have this rigorous scientific method, but it was like a primordial form of science. So you can see how like rationality, rationality and rationalism hasn't always been available to us as a human race. It only kind of popped up one day, right? So, and eventually rationalism worked its way into the individual's development path. So now everyone has access to it. So it's really cool if you think about it that way, because that means that in the far, far future, if this theory is correct, which, you know, who knows, whatever. <laughs> but if this theory is correct, in the far, far future, there will be stages of development that we have, like, we can't even conceive of right now, right? And the human race is going to be rocking. Like, we're going to be doing really amazing things. So let's think about like, and take a look at the different models available to us. Let's talk about spiral dynamics. Spiral dynamics attaches colors to each of the developmental stages 
in a given model, right? So there's a lot of different developmental, developmental models out there, and there's not really one correct one or one true one. They all together kind of like help give us a somewhat complete, more or less, picture of what's going on, at least for right now, right? Because in reality, we, we, we really don't know what's going on. Um, but the different colors, and I'm going to show you here, the different colors associate with the different stages of development. So here, this line right here, this brown line, where you see like concrete operational, formal operational, this stuff is Piaget's model. These are the stages that kids go through. And then here's Spiral Dynamics, they just attach a color to each one of these stages. So Gene Gepster has a model, and it's called Structures of Consciousness. And it's just, you know, the same idea, like consciousness evolves over time, and one structure is built, and then es essentially you have another structure that's placed on top of it. So the stage below uh, kind of like holds all the information of the, the stage, the stage above holds all the information of the stage below it, um, but then like keeps on growing. So it's never like a complete cycle, at least we don't think so. It's never like a complete line all the way up to the top. Eh, well, who really knows, right? So, Gene Gepster's model I really like because it attaches the words that are pretty common and generally give a one-word description of each stage um, to the different models. So, his model is archaic, magic, mythic, rational, pluralistic, and integral. If you think about Gene Gepster's model in terms of how we have evolved evolved as a race, uh, archaic represents our primordial form. Like, we've just kind of like risen up. We don't really know what's going on as human beings. And, you know, we don't really know what this was like. Uh, this is kind of like, in my point of view, kind of like a placeholder stage because we don't really have any direct evidence or really know like what was going on subjectively, right? If you watch the first video in the Integral series, uh, you'll, we're talking about the upper left quadrant. We don't really know subjectively what's going on in the head of someone in the primordial archaic stage, at least not from what I found, not from what I can tell. Uh, so archaic is just kind of like your baseline stage, boom, we exist, right? Just kind of like how in Piaget's model, the sensory motor stage is just your, your, your born, your, 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 your organs work, right? Your, your, you can feel things and see things, so your senses are working, but you, you really can't organize them and collect them in any kind of meaningful way to like produce thought and like analyze and think about things, right? That is, comes later. So, uh, archaic magic is his next stage. So magic kind of represents that way of thinking that I was talking about earlier that a child might have. So, for example, a child might um, maybe associate different events with uh, different thoughts in their own mind. So if a child is thinking that it rains, and then outside he, that child sees it raining, that child will make this connection, oh, like, I thought of the rain, and then it rained, therefore, I can do that whenever I want, right? Um, and eventually, the child grows up to see that's no longer the case. So we see this in our own history as well, with different magical ways of thinking, and different groups and organizations that have, like, that organized around this way of thought. And I just want to kind of, I guess, pause briefly here and say that, like, in yeah, like, stages of development implied in the name and in nature, they are like a hierarchy, right? You move laterally through them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that like one stage by itself is like more true or less true or more correct or less correct or more right or more wrong than another. So there are tons of people that exist today that have like a certain amount of magical thinking. Like one person isn't necessarily gonna be completely 100% magical thinkers. Like maybe they're out there. I haven't met one before. But some people, including me, like, we have a bit of this purple is the color in Spiral Dynamics, but this kind of, like, purple uh, magical thoughts that go on in our head. It's just a part of our nature. It's a part of who we are. It's something that we grow through. And sometimes, like, we grow further up the chain, and sometimes we don't. And each, like I said, each stage by itself doesn't represent the whole picture. Uh, for example, the next stage, Mythic, okay? This is Gepser's stage. Uh, so mythic is, is, is described pretty well, like, so when a child gets to the point where he or she realizes that, you know, they can't just think of rain 
and then make it rain outside whenever they want to, they get a little confused. And so they need to like kind of assert that power onto something or someone else because they realize that they don't have it themselves. So they may, they may do that uh, for their parents. They might do that for a character on a TV show they really like. Um, if they grew up in like a super religious or super spiritual family, they might assert that on like a mythical form of God. And I'm not using any certain definition of God. I'm just kind of using God as a, as a word that, a, you know, that a child might conceive. Like how does a small child that is moving from the magic uh, stage to the mythic stage perceive God? Probably not in the same way that I do. Probably not in the same way you do. Probably not in the same way most of us do, right? And at the same time, like, People who are much older than me and yet much younger than me perceive God in completely different ways than I will. Like adults perceive God differently and define God differently. So, um, but yeah, so I just think that's a good example of like how magic transitions into mythic. So we see this in society as well. Like in, in society, I mean like ancient historical society. Uh, we see this in history as our species has evolved and gone into the mythic realm. When, when groups of people and organizations and tribes realize that they didn't all have like these magical powers, but they still notice like different synchronicities happening or they still notice different events and they're trying to connect all these dots and, and figure out what's going on. So it was very easy to just kind of like assert that on onto something else, assert that onto another authority. And so if you take a look at like the magic stage and the mythic stage, okay? So according to these developmental models, mythic is higher, but it's higher simply because it just comes after the mythic stage. Or sorry, mythic is higher just because it comes after the magic stage. But if you look at the stages separately, the mythic doesn't really more or less accurately describe how the world works than the magic, right? They're just different interpretations of what's going on. So some people, uh, including myself, like sometimes feel like, oh, like, you know, I identify really well with stage five, you know, whatever that is. And and so people who are, you know, in stage six, I feel like maybe they look down on me. And, and generally that's not the case. Like generally people who are well-informed and well-educated with this stuff, as you develop, your sense of empathy deepens, your sense of connection deepens, your sense of understanding deepens, and that kind of stuff doesn't really go on as much. So uh, moving on to where I kind of view myself is in the rational stage. This is the birth of science. It's the orange color in spiral dynamics. And so speaking of different connections, right? So we had magical thinking, we had mythic thinking, then finally we have the scientific method. We have, we have our thoughts observing uh, events happening in what we call the objective realm. For those of you who watched my first video, this is the upper right quadrant in the four quadrant model. And so the scientific method represents the rational structure. Uh, it represents the orange level of development in spiral dynamics. You have a scientific method. You have an observer, and then you 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 observe information, you analyze it, uh, you come up with a hypothesis, uh, you test it out, you try to replicate it. Like we have this whole procedure for kind of trying to figure out like what's real and what's not real, define ourselves, define the world around us. Like I said, I generally view myself as being in and operating in mostly maybe about 60% of the rational stage. I just think that makes sense to me. It makes sense for the kind of life I live. Like I work in information technology. Uh, it just makes sense. I've always, I read a lot of books. I've always been really analytical. So I identify mostly with this kind of like rational way of thinking, but that's not the end of the journey according to these, according to these developmental models. The next stage is called pluralistic. Pluralistic kind of seeks to inform people that uh, one, stage of development isn't necessarily superior to another, right? This is kind of touching on what I spoke of before. However, this stage in Spiral Dynamics, the green stage or the pluralistic stage in Gebser's words, will sometimes say that all perspectives are the same and that one person's point of view is always no better than the other, not because it only shows a, a part of a larger picture, which is uh, what is something that an idea that I'm sympathetic to, but that Green will say, okay, well, this is just tells one story, and this t perspective tells another story, and they're just both equal, and all perspectives are equal because that's just the way it is, and that's the way of thinking that I remember like. I remember thinking that way myself sometimes, like in the past. I remember in 2007, and this is kind of a kind of a heartfelt 
kind of rough and embarrassing story to tell, but in, in, in 2007, there was the Virginia Tech shooting, right? And I remember watching this video by Stuart Davis, um, and I think if you just Google or YouTube Stuart Davis, Virginia Tech, you will find this video. And Stuart Davis kind of like is interviewing different people uh, about what they think about what happened with the Virginia Tech shooting. And there was this one girl, or there's a couple girls on this video, I remember watching this very clearly in 2007, who said like, look, I can't judge what this person who shot and killed these people did because I don't know what's going on in their heads. And I, I just, you know, their perspective is probably true for them. And my perspective of it being wrong is true for me, but I can't judge that person. And, you know, I've, I, I remember watching that video and being like, yeah, like, I agree with that. I agree with that. And probably, I don't know, maybe a couple years, two, three, maybe four years later. <laughs> uh, so very recently, have I been like coming to the ideas like, no, like actually like there is some depth to morality there is some depth to what's right and what's wrong and and perhaps like perhaps that green sense or that pluralistic sense of everyone being correct is kind of like a person's intuition that everyone is correct but only in certain percentages right because everyone can't be right at once everyone can't be wrong at once so maybe everyone's perspective holds a really important piece to reality and a really important piece to what's going on in the world, but that when you kind of take absolute statements and say like, this is X or this isn't X, then the model falls apart and you really can't hold something complete in your mind. So um, yeah, it's like, I feel like really heartfelt sharing that with you guys because it's, it's, it's just, I don't know, I, I feel sad talking about the event and I also feel sad about kind of like my thoughts at the time. And I and I don't feel necessarily embarrassed about them when I just kind of like look back in retrospect, but I definitely feel embarrassed about them kind of talking about it on camera and knowing that people that I don't know and people that I do know are gonna watch this. And now is a good time, I think, to introduce kind of like how this development process is thought to work because I just introduced the concept of morality, right? So. So these stages, like we don't just hop from one stage to another. We just don't, we don't exist in magical thinking and then one day wake up and we're in mythical or we're in mythical and one day we wake up and we're in rational, right? We have different intelligences. If you read any of Howard Gardner's work, we uh, all hold like different ideas and different ways of thinking and different intellig intelligences that evolve separately over time. So someone might have a really strong kinesthetic intelligence. These people tend to be athletes. Some people have a really strong like sense of reason or like analytical thinking. Like maybe these people tend to be uh, academics or something. So we have different ways of thinking. Like we have emotional intelligence, we have spiritual intelligence, we have heart intelligence, right? And all of these morality, we have, and all these evolve in different ways. So these are called lines of development and you can see them here. So these colors again represent these stages and these lines all grow and develop through each stage. So you can see in this particular model, if this was like a person of like a person's psyche, this mapped a person's psyche, then this stage here, which is spiritual, you can see it's pretty far up, and but it's higher than um, the kinesthetic stage right here. So that's what I meant earlier when I said that I kind of feel that predominantly I'm orange or rational and scientific and thinking, and I think I'm really centered around that stage, but there's other parts of me that I feel like are developed lower and maybe even developed higher. I'm not really sure, and it's, it's really hard to measure this stuff out, um, but people are working on it, right? And uh, okay, next stage is integral, and integral is kind of just the idea that green has given birth to, and I think green, uh, the pluralistic stage, uh, I have all the respect for the stage, even though I don't, I'm not even convinced that I'm there yet, right? Um, because they really introduced the idea of having like, yeah, like, okay, everyone's correct. So when you had like rationalists and like rational scientists and maybe mythic religious people like battling it out, green came in and said, no, we're all right. And then integral people came in and said, we are all right but only in specific certain percentages, right? Certain ways. So if you remove absolute statements and then bring all those perspectives together, we can have like one absolute perspective of humanity that is like a snapshot of humanity right now. And that 
is the world around us. That's the world we can perceive, and that's awesome. So this video is getting really long, and I just gave a very brief description of stages of development. Just something that's coming up in the future. Uh, one is going to be how you can accelerate your own psychological growth, right? What are different techniques, different hacks you can use to try and attempt to grow psychologically faster, right? Maybe you can get through some of these stages in a shorter time by doing certain practices. And another thing I'm gonna talk about is how you can measure this stuff, right? Because a lot of this stuff, especially when you were talking about stages that are outside the scope of rationality and outside the scope of science, well, when you think about it, well, like, how is that something you can measure? And some people might say, if you can't measure it, then why are you even talking about it? Um, we're going to get into how that works, how that happens. And I believe there's some really convincing evidence out there that um, is suggests that this stuff is at least somewhat true and that it's something worth following. And it's a map of our psyche. It's a map of where we're going and headed as an individual. It's a map of where we're going as a human race. It's something that we can follow, we can know what's coming up next, and if we take the opportunity, we can get there faster. And and it sounds kind of, sounds kind of like tran transhumanism, or if, if you played the game Deus Ex, like it kind of sounds like that because you get like augmentations and machines to help evolve, but, and I guess they, then you know that is kind of similar. But um, this is like, just kind of like a completely organic, kind of like biohack, right, in terms of how to grow. So I hope you enjoyed this video about growth. Uh, stay tuned for my next video. It's probably going to be about measuring these different lines of development or maybe about hacking them on how to go further, depending on which one I want to record first. I guess it makes sense to record how to measure them. Anyway, we'll see. Thanks a lot for watching. Take care.